from heaven to the prophets of Baal. He said, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. First Kings 19.4, Elijah um, goes and he's running under the juniper tree and he says, it's enough now, O Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. Then as things progress and the Lord comes and he ministers to him and the angel comes and he gives him cakes and all that kind of stuff, um, then Elijah starts to have this dialogue with God. And God says to him, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he says, I, only I am left that seek you and, the, and, and, and they that seek to take away my life. So then God comes in and after he's, he's gotten him all strong again in his physical and his spiritual body, he tries to show Elijah his strength and tries to show him that, you know, um, I'm the mighty God, right? And that my, my voice is in the quietness. So he sends a fire and he sends an earthquake and, and, um, and he sends the wind. And Elijah's walk, watching from the cave and he's seeing all this mighty splendor of God's demonstration of power. And the Lord asks him again. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah again responds, this big long litany that he explains of the things that he's done for the kingdom. And then he, he sums it up by saying, and I, only I am left that they that seek to take away my life. I bring this out to say that Elijah was anointed. Elijah heard from God. Elijah was used of God in incredible ways. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never had the privilege of calling down fire from heaven. And God did remind him that, hey, you're not the only one. I've got 7,000 others that haven't, haven't um, bowed their knees to Baal. But what I really want to talk to you about in the time that we have today is to tell you that I think all too often it's so easy to slip into that, what about me? I'm doing my stuff, God. I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing for the kingdom. I was here yesterday, and I did this today, and I was up early, and I, and I, and I and I. Um, we used to have friends, they've moved out of state now, but when their daughter was young, we'd have them over to play um, with the grandkids and I'd be getting cookies or lemonade or whatever I was doing. And she would forever say as I'm trying to serve the table of people or whatever, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? It didn't matter what it was. But I think sometimes in our humanity, we get that way, don't we? Scientific American Magazine says that 60% of our conversations are about ourselves. It also goes on to say that 80% of our conversations are about ourselves when we're on social media of any kind. There's actually a, a, a new um, area of disease now um, that is an illegitimate disease that people go and are treated for, and it's actually called self-itis. I don't have the time to go through all the criteria that causes you to meet the self-itis. But I will tell you that if we're not careful, we can become so self-focused that we're not kingdom focused. I will tell you that the stats for 2018, there's 544 homeless, 700,000 children, 700, children that are abused annually, 12 million women that are abused. There were 542 murders in Chicago last year. And still I fear that in myself, and yea, I say sometimes in the church, we come in and it's what about me? And I will tell you that that's not God's way. God compels us. He tells us to go and to compel them to come in. He says, give your coat and your cloak also. He says, reach to the hungry. He says, if you've done it to the least of these, that you've done it unto me. He says, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, that you need to be the least in the kingdom. And all too often we hold on to our own sense of satisfaction and we don't look outward. I am sharing this as you will find of anyone that does any kind of teaching because you learn your own lessons, right? What you put out there is because you've learned it yourself. And these are things that I've learned and I wanna leave you with this little poem called, My Name is Pride. My name is Pride, I am a cheater. I cheat you of your God-given destiny because you demand your own way. I cheat you of contentment because you deserve better than this. I cheat you of knowledge because you already know it all. I cheat you of healing because you're too full of me to forgive me. I cheat you of holiness because you refuse to admit when you're wrong. I cheat you of vision because you'd rather look in the mirror than out the window. I cheat you of genuine friendship because nobody's going to know the real you. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. Um.
wife and I have been together for 32 years. Wow. <clears throat> Honey, it's been wonderful. Married 32 years. Boy, you, that sounds like old people. Married that long. That's a long time. But it's been wonderful. What a great 32 years it has been and another 32 years to go. Maybe, well, whatever God does. Let me commend you on yesterday. What a great day we had. An hour or so of prayer. God moved in such a mighty way. The power of God was here. People were ministered to. Miracles happened. People were binding together in prayer for the rest of the church, for the backsliders, for your families, people that are addicted, people that are diseased, people that are infirmed. God was touching people. <coughs> Let me also come in. What a great executive leadership meeting we had yesterday. So, so much great input, so much sacrifice uh, that, that people have poured into the church. They're investing into the kingdom of God, and I thank you publicly for that. I also thank you for uh, we have raised so far for Stephen and Emily Rodriguez for going to Malaysia, uh, $24,500. I think we ought to thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> we truly believe in it. And you can just, uh, as they're leaving on uh, uh, August 4th, they're flying out that night about midnight. And please keep them in your prayers and when you send send the money just to the church you can give it in the offering we'll send it all to the headquarters uh, we have the account number etc but we'll keep supporting them they're heading out to uh to uh, brother hoffman's next weekend uh, pray for brother williams as brother and sister williams head over to saint charles to preach for them as they're gone pray for a mighty move of god there we're so excited about being in the new building God's, God's starting great things. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. As we turn to there, if you're a visitor here today, we're so glad you're here. Great things are about to happen. We are attempting to once again bring inspirational word of God to us, doctrinally, correctionally, inspirationally, etc. And then we always come to the altar afterwards um, and we write down all of our sins. No, I'm kidding. We come to the altar and allow and say, God, what I just heard of the word, let that, let it find a place of a holding place in my heart. Let it, I don't want to just say, wow, that was good. And then go out and be the same. I always have been, but God, let it find a place to lodge in my heart. Let the seed find a place. Let not the fowl of the air steal it away. And, and, and let me walk away unaffected. Let me also say the preaching uh, Wednesday night. What an awesome job Pastor By did. What a great job the inspirationalists have been doing. I'm just powerful. They're putting a lot of word and a lot of prayer into it. And I thank God for blessing this church with such powerful anointing. Genesis 4 and 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, <clears throat> and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, he was very upset, <clears throat> and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. We find Cain and his brother Abel. They both came. They both brought, but only one was accepted. Cain came with a bad attitude. So it wasn't just 
coming that was important and it wasn't just giving that was important it was how he gave that was important as well i want to preach to us this morning on the title how you coming how you coming let's pray together just for a moment lord <clears throat> let the word of god come to us anoint it let it be for us let it be a timely word for us God, challenge us to not only come and not only bring, but God, to come in a right way, in a right manner, in a right method. Help us, Lord, to approach you with great reverence and awe, and honor and respect unto you. And God, let us do things your way, we pray. And we ask for your blessing, and your power, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> <clears throat> they both came they both brought I have told that story in Bible studies over and over again and I usually get a rise of some sort most individuals if not all religious people that live for God at least according to their own ideas. They feel and say, if I just do my best, and if I just do what I can, and yet, if I just give God what I have, if I just do things the best I understand, and yet we find this story where two brothers raised the same way, <clears throat> raised under the same parents, under the same God, in the same place and we find them bringing an offering unto God and for some reason God accepted one and he didn't accept the other well they came yes and they both brought an offering yes and one was a keeper of sheep and one was a tiller of the ground yes but God said it doesn't matter what you do it matters what you bring it matters how you bring to me I find Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he said, Come unto me all, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, I do want you to come. I want, if you're, if you're tired, come. If you're heavy laden, you've got all sorts of pressure on your life. I want you to come. If you're living in sin, I want you to come. There's also concepts out there that say, I will come to God when my life is ready, when my life is cleaned up, when I have fixed everything. Oh, come on. If you could fix everything in your life, you wouldn't need God. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get good to get God. I'm going to get God to I'm going to get God to get good. Try to say that three times fast. Get yourself all messed up. <laughs> but come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And then he said something that was quite interesting. Most people look at God as somebody who has incredible demands that are almost impossible to respond to, almost impossible to accept. And yet he says this. You're tired, you're, you're under lots of pressure. You come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. You come to me and I will give you rest. And then he says this, take. He didn't say, submit, come up here and just submit and I'm going to put the shackles on you. He said, take my yoke. He said, I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to put it there. Come unto me, all you that labor in heavenly land. I will give you rest. Take. You come get it. You come and take. It depends on how you come. You can come up and you can circle around that thing if you want. You can look at it. You can say it's the wrong size. 
You can say it looks a little uncomfortable. You can say, I don't like what it's made out of. Somebody else was wearing it before I got it. I don't like hand-me-downs. And you can make all sorts of excuses, and you can, you, can, you can tell yourself and convince yourself why. I shouldn't put that thing on. But Jesus said, take. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest. Notice he ties the rest to the yoke. <laughs> I want the yoke. I want the yoke of rest. God, I want the rest, and I want the release, and I want the deliverance, and I want the blessing, and I want the promise. And he said, take. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest. What if I don't take the yoke? No rest. <laughs> All right, put it on me. No, take it. Take up your cross. Notice how he, he didn't say, you come by in a line and I'll lay it on you. He didn't say that. He said, take. Because it depends on how you come. If you come and say, all right, I'll let you torture me, God. He said, no, 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 no. You, you take. You pick it up. And trust me, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. And then he says, for my yoke is easy. What is the perception of most of Christianity today and most of the world who looks at Christianity and says, why would you do that? Why would you do what Jesus tells you to do? What a tyrant he is. And he said, here's the deal. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you come under a heavy load and you put that on, something happens when you put that on, we look at it as adding to Jesus. Jesus looks at the yoke as taking away from. He said, you're going to find rest. My yoke is easy, not heavy. He, he said, your burden is heavy. Mine is light. When you put this on, something happens to your burden and it becomes lighter. I know why. Because the yoke wasn't for one. It was for two. The yoke was to, was to lock two things together. It was to harness two things together so they could pull together. Jesus said, take my. He didn't say, take ah. He said, take my yoke upon you. He said, I'm carrying this thing and there's an empty hole. There's an empty harness here. You want to get in? You get in, I'll help you pull. I'll make everything lighter. I'll make it easy for you. But you got to take it. I won't put it on you. That's what this harness and yoke is all about. You're already carrying a yoke of the world. And he said, Come on, there's an open spot just for you, but you got to take it. How are you coming? How do we perceive the kingdom of God? Do we perceive the kingdom of God as I have to, and I have to, and I can't, and I have to? And he said, my yoke is easy. Easy. Comp we look at that compared to what? <laughs> I'm having a rough time. I've been in the church 33 years. I'm having a rough time. He said, my yoke is easy. I always just look at, my, look at myself in the mirror and say, imagine what this would be like if he wasn't in the other side. <laughs> it would be suicide. It would be drugs, alcohol. It would be incarcerated. It would be in a psych ward. That's where I would be if I didn't have him in the other side of my yoke. But he's carrying it with me. He said, I'm not going to do it for you, but I'll do it with you. Because my yoke is easy. Matthew 24, then shall two be in the field and one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill and the one, what's he talking about? He's talking about two people standing together in an assembly line, making parts for cars or just standing next to each other. Hey, how you doing? Where'd he go? Must have gone on break. It's not even lunchtime. What's going on? Two shall be grinding at the mill and one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. Pay attention. 
Be careful, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that the, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. How you coming? It matters how we come. He said, be also ready. Well, what if we're not? Two shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other shall be left. It depends on how we come. It depends on whether we're ready or not, whether we are the one that is taken or the one that is left. It matters how we come, but it also matters how we leave. The prodigal in Luke chapter 15, the Bible says, and the younger of them said to his father, notice this, he came to his father. He came. How did you come? Not so good. He came and said, give me the portion of my goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. He came to his father and he said, give me. And the generation in which we live today is a give me generation. It is an entitlement generation. It is a microwave generation. It is all about give me. And Sister Goff said it so well. It's all about me. This is all about me. And God said, this is not about us. It's about the kingdom. It's about others. This is the, that's so hard for this generation to break. It's all trying to hoard unto ourselves. And God says, no, this is about my kingdom. This is about helping others. But he said, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And then in verse 19, just seven verses later, he came saying, give me. And when his life was a shambles, he said, I am no more, no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me, make me as one of thy hired servants. The first time he came, he said, give me. The second time he came to his father, he said, make me. Notice the change of attitude. The difference in coming. How you coming? When we come to God, do we say, give me? Or do we say, make me? One has our hand out. The other one has our hands up. Make me. Make me. A white flag. Stick up your hands. I surrender to you, God. Make me one of your hired servants. He didn't say, make me do. He said, make me a servant. That was my problem. I was entitled. And God said, don't come to me with entitlement. Come to me with a servant attitude. Make me as one of your hired servants. We can change. This is what that story says to me. I can change how I come to him. I can come saying, give me. But I also can, <laughs> God has the ability to change our minds. How are you coming? Not good. Not good. All right. How about if we allow some circumstances in your life to get your attention, to allow you to come to yourself? Um, okay. All right. I think I can handle that. Okay. No, I can't handle this anymore. You know, I think I figured this out. I'm going back home. I'm going to go and say, Father, make me. I trust you with my future. I trust you with your molding and shaping of my life. I trust you with my future. I trust you with every step of my life. I trust you. I'm not going to do this my way. Give me so that I can forge my own future. And the Father says, I will make you. I'll make you what you need to be if you'll let me. We can change how we come, but we can't change how we go. What does that mean? I can change how I come to God. I could change my mind. I can change my approach. I can change my attitude. But once I'm gone, once I take my last breath, I've had people call me from my past life and they say, you know, you know, Bob, he's dead. He gassed himself in a car. 22 years old. You know, pray for him. 
And I look, and I'm like, you know, I can pray for his family, and I can pray for you. But you can't change how you go. Once you go, you've gone. Whatever that is. You know, you know, Rob, he, he stuck a shotgun in his mouth and blew his head off at age 20. My good friend, Rob Green. Pray for him. I've had those phone calls. You know, Dave, Dave gassed himself in a car. These are all friends of mine. He's no longer here. You, you got to pray for him. I, I can't pray for Dave. I prayed for him yesterday, but I can't pray for him anymore. Whatever he has gone is gone. Is, he has gone on. I can't change that there is a great gulf between. You see, the rich man said, oh, Abraham, please tell them to do this and give me a drink and cross. Nope, can't cross. You can't cross that great divide. Once you end up on one side, you're there. You can't change how you go, but you can change today how you come. You can change how you're coming. You can change today how you approach God if you give yourself a chance. Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. This is John the Baptist. We had fun, talked about this in one of my Bible studies this week. Came to his baptism. John the Baptist is baptizing all these people. Woohoo! They're having conversions. They're having fun. And all of a sudden, Pharisees and Sadducees come to him. And he said, Oh, generation of vipers, how many people would still get baptized after a comment like that? Someone walks in, and you, oh, yeah, generation of vipers. Well, I'll never come in these, this house again. I'll never come back to that church again. John, he didn't have a problem. Oh, you generation, you bunch of snakes. <laughs> wow. He said this, who hath warned you? Somebody warned you. Somebody gave you a message, and they said, this could be bad. This is not heading in the right direction. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There is wrath coming, and somebody gave them an inside scoop and said, you better, you better do this. This is, this is going to help you get away from the wrath. But notice this. John looks at him. And he said, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. They came. That's good. They were going to get baptized. That's good. But John said, I don't like the way you're coming. You're not coming the right way. How are you coming? Not good. How are you coming? Well, we're coming to flee wrath. He said, nope, not good enough. I don't want you to get baptized just to get away from wrath. He said, God is not interested in you serving him out of fear. He wants you to serve him out of love and out of faith. He doesn't want you to come to heaven by fear. He said, who hath warned you of the wrath to come? If somebody told you, that's why this heaven or hell thing, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Well, you can get somebody's attention. And you can get somebody to say, well, all right then. Man, if that's, if that's in the Bible, I'll, okay. Well, where's the relationship? Where's the love? Where's, he didn't make you to run from danger. That's not why he made you. And it, I mean, there's, there's all these fires breaking out all over. And we run that way. And, and then a fire breaks out. And you run that way. And he doesn't want us to look at these bunch of puppets just, ah! Just running from fear. He doesn't want you to run from fear. He wants you to run to him. Yeah. How you coming? Are you running from or are you running to? God says it depends how you coming. Are you coming to him out of love? Has somebody. That's why I never, I never try to scare somebody to Jesus. I don't want to scare them because if they come to him because of fear, They'll leave because of fear. 
I want to share with them the incredible love of a Savior that looked into the future and saw you, saw your name, saw your struggles, and said, yeah. That's the prayer. I want to show them how much I love them. I want to show them through my word and my actions, the fact that I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that pull off the hair. They pulled his beard off. I'm going to let them whip me. I'm going to let them torture me. And I'm going to let them put me on a cross to show you how much I love you. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity and lay down some promises that you can take if you want. One of them is my spirit. You can have my, you can take up my spirit into your heart. The Bible says it's a river of living water. Why do Pentecostals just, why do they get so nuts in preaching that stuff? It's because it's so wonderful. It's joy unspeakable. There is nothing in this world that is greater than the presence of God inside us. That's, talk about not serving out of fear. You come out of love. I want that. I want to feel the love of God. This is the love of God that passes all understanding. Are we coming to or just running from? John 7, 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, notice the qualifier. Jesus didn't just stand up and say, come here. I had some rules for you. He said, if any man thirst, is there something inside of you that is crying out for more? I got everything in this world that I want. Then this isn't for you. But if there's something inside your heart that's saying, I'm thirsty. I'm looking for something real. The world says this is important, and the world says that, and all these different Eastern religions and et cetera, they say this. But Jesus, what do you say? You say, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit that they which believe on him should receive. Why did I say that again? It's because of this. Don't just come. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come. <clears throat> Don't just come. Don't just come to Jesus. Don't just come to John's baptism. Don't just come to church. If you're thirsty. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And don't just come. Come thirsty and drink. Don't just come thirsty. Come and drink. Notice all these qualifiers. If any man thirst, let him come. Thirst, come drink. And then he said this. He said, he that believeth. So don't just come. Don't just thirst. Don't just drink, but believe. Believe on me as the scripture has said. And then he finishes by saying this, which they that believe on him should receive. We need to thirst. We need to come. We need to drink. We need to believe. <clears throat> and we need to receive. <clears throat> That's what Jesus is offering today. Another point we mentioned in Bible study, 1 Corinthians 11. This was quite interesting that the question was asked as I was studying this. It says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread <clears throat> and drink this cup, just talking about communion. Whoever eats it and drinks it unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Communion. Honoring the Lord, honoring his death. We do show forth his death in this act of communion. He was saying, <clears throat> Paul was saying to the church, don't just come. Don't just come. Don't just eat and drink. That's the problem. People come and they eat and drink. 
<clears throat> the Bible says if they come unworthily that, and they eat, they, they eat and drink damnation unto themselves. He said, don't do that. Don't just come and eat and drink. Don't do that. How are you coming? Well, then I better not do it. No, that's not what he said. He said, when you do it, examine yourself. Then let him eat. He said, it depends on how you come. I want you to honor my death on the cross, but don't just come and eat and drink the bread and the grape juice. Don't do that. Come and examine because it makes a difference how we come. How are you coming this morning? People have said, come as you are. I believe that. Come as you are, but don't leave as you are. Galatians 5 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. And the whole Christendom says amen. You've been called unto liberty. I'm free. For he that the Son sets free is free indeed. He said, You have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use your newfound liberty to live in sin the way you used to. Something needs to change. That's where liberty comes. Where does liberty come from? It's a lack of bondage. It's a lack of being incarcerated. Sin binds us. Liberty says, I've been set free from that. So why would we say, I'm free in Jesus, and then go back to bondage? It's like getting out and going to work, and at night, going back to the prison bars. Closing the door behind you like, like what Otis did on Mayberry RFD. You know, Andy Griffith, Otis. That must be really old, huh? <laughs> every morning he would get out and he would go out and he would hang up the keys and go out and do his thing and he'd come back drunk every night and he'd lock himself up and put him. That's how some people treat Christians. They, they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to bed at night in prison and I'm going to get up in the morning and go do my stuff and I'm going to act like a Christian at night. I'm going to go back and I'm going to lock myself. God said, I don't want you to do that anymore. You don't have to live in sin. You can be free. Really free. Uh, yes. And he said, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love. Notice the correlation. But by love, serve one another. Serve one another. He said, don't just come. Don't just believe. Don't just drink. But when you do, I want you to get away from sin. And I want you to, by love, serve one another. That's what this is all about. It's about serving. How you coming? Matthew 19, you have to pull, pull a couple Gospels together to figure out what he was saying, but they call him the rich young ruler. You have to pull a couple together to find out that he was rich and that he was young and that he was a ruler. But he came in Matthew 19, 16, it says, And behold, one came. He came. How you coming, rich young ruler? I came. And said unto him, Good master, good job. Because there's nobody good but God. Way to go. You're hitting on all cylinders so far. You came and you identified him as the Messiah. Good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? In verse 22, it ends by saying, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. We can come and we can say the right thing. We can come and we can say, good master. Wow, that person must know God. Good master. We can even ask. We can come and we can say and we can ask, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? You know how many times I've been asked that question? What must I do? Wow, it sounds sincere. Do I need to change something, oh good master? Oh, look, it's a good story. The problem is, is when the answer came. 
How you coming, rich young ruler? Well, I came okay. But I was brought to a decision. Here's the decision. Take. Take up my yoke. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy. I don't believe you. Okay, you can take it up or... said he walked away sorrowful. There are many people in the word of God that came to him. And there is a difference between some that came and took and walked away. Some came and didn't take and walked away sorrowful. It matters how you come. Rich young ruler, how did you come to him? You came in pride. Oh, let me tell you all that I've done. What must I do? Well, you got to do this and you... Make sure you don't sin and make sure you don't, well, I've done all of that up from my youth. And he said, take what you have, sell and give some to the poor. And he said, ooh, that's my yoke. No thanks. No thanks. Not interested. How did you come? Did you come hungry and thirsty? Or did you come full of pride saying, I, I mean, <laughs> there's no reason why he wouldn't accept me. I mean, I'll probably just like grease skids. I'll slide right through the pearly gates and woohoo, never slow down. Of all the things, the way that I've lived up till now, it should be smooth sailing. He had great possessions. What about the woman in adultery? And I'm closing. She was caught in adultery in John 8. She was brought to Jesus. Some people come and some people are brought. I was kind of brought. Hey, there's good music. Hey, come on. I was snagged into coming to a Pentecostal service. This woman, when she got to Jesus, she didn't really want to be there. She wasn't there because she said, you know, I think I'm going to go to Bartlett UPC this morning. She didn't do that. She was caught in the midst of sin, and someone said, you go with me to church today. And they drug her, and they threw her at Jesus' feet. We'll get you here any way we can. <laughs> we'll do anything we can to get you here. But it still matters how you come. She was forced, but even though she was forced to get there, something happened in her where Jesus looked at her and he looked at them and he said, let him who hath no sin cast the first stone. And one by one from the oldest to the youngest, they began to go away until it was just him and her. You see, it matters today. Jesus is not interested in you in a crowd. Jesus is going to look around and he's going to say, I want to talk to you, you alone. I'll, I'll make everybody else in the spirit go away. And what's going to happen just like it happened with me and with you and with you and with you. All of a sudden it was like everybody cleared out. Jerry, you know what I'm talking about. It was, I mean, I, I read about him. I, I, I heard about him. But all of a sudden in, in the church was full of people and I'm like, Look at all these people. There ain't no way I'm going up there. And yet all of a sudden I found myself just what, taking that long walk down the, down the hallway. That long walk. And when I raised my hands, it's like everybody cleared out. It was just him and I. He said, it's all right, I'll get rid of them. They were still there, but I didn't know it. And I didn't care. I had this connection with him. And there she was sit She was on the floor, on the ground. And Jesus said, where are those thine accusers? Where are the people that brought you? Where are the people that drug you here? I have none. I have none. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Wait a minute. It matters how you come, but it also, oh, come on, oh, come on. It matters how you go. 
He didn't just say, you sinned, I don't worry about it. He said, you came and now you have a decision to make. There is a fork in the road. And he said this, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. There was a qualification on her going. That qualification was you make a decision today to stop living like that. That's what I'm asking you to do. My no condemnation comes with a price. It comes with going and sinning no more. Would you stand with me? She didn't choose how she got there, but she definitely chose how she left. Judas came. Judas came. Judas followed. Judas experienced. But Judas left. And he left not good. See, Judas had a problem. Judas was not willing to take up the yoke. He just wasn't willing to let go of greed. And it was greed that was eventually what destroyed him. Take up my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. I don't know, I, I've done all these other things. Yes, yeah, so did the rich young ruler. And Jesus was like, I know you have a weakness with money, so I'm going to let you be the treasurer. Oh. Oh. Whatever your weakness is, he's going to say, here, you're in charge. Don't you understand that this world knows what your weakness is? And they will come to you, and they will, here you go. Here you go. I'm going to give you a chance to fail. I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to give you exactly what it is that will destroy you. You can come, but you can come thirsty. You can come with the right intention, or you can come with the wrong intention. There are different approaches and reasons that people come to Jesus. But the leper of Luke 17, 10 left healed, but only one left whole. That's because it matters how you come. Some, nine of them came, give me. And the one that noticed that his life was changed, he came back and he bowed. He was a servant. He was, oh, I worship you. Go thy way. You're going to be whole. See, it matters how we come. Ten left healed, only one left whole. The Syrophoenician, she came in Mark 7. She came hungry. She came determined to get her daughter set free of the demon. And Jesus said, it's not right to give the children's meat to the dogs. <laughs> How you coming? Can Jesus say anything he wants to you? And you just say, it doesn't matter what you say to me. My daughter has a demon and she needs to be set free. Do you come determined? Do you come with a determination in your heart that says, it doesn't matter what I hear preached. It doesn't matter who's singing. It doesn't matter how hot or cold it is. It doesn't matter what color tie the guy has on. I'm coming. I'm coming because I'm not going to let go. Somebody in my life is in need. Or lastly, the man that had the demon-possessed son. He came. People prayed and nothing happened. And he said, I'm not leaving. Jesus, how come they couldn't cast him out? He didn't give up. He came back. And he said, Lord, I need help. Do you come determined? Do you come, do you come like Cain or do you come like Abel? Do you come like Jacob or are you to come like Esau? How do we come? How are you coming? I told you I would open these altars. What is the question today? The question is, do we come right? Do we come to church right? Do we go to prayer 
right? Do we give right? Do we come to the altar right? Are you coming? These altars are open today. Let that seed touch your heart. God's talking to some people this morning. He's saying, I want to show you how awesome I am. But how you leave is directly related to how you come. That's the message today. How you leave this altar is directly related to how you come. Do you come thirsty? Do you come surrendering to his presence? Do you come, Lord, make me. I'll take up your yoke this morning, Jesus. The Lord wants to show himself to somebody. He wants to show his glory to somebody. Are you thirsty for something real? He's waiting. And he has laid some promises at this altar if you'll come. Just come. Jesus, look at your neighbor and just say, let's go get some. Let's, let's come the right way. Let's come to him hungry. Let's come to him sincerely. Let's come. And let's come now. Jesus, that's it. Let's help somebody and bring them to the altar. Let's go. Let's go do this right. Let's worship. Jesus. There are some miracles and promises waiting for you. There's deliverance waiting. There's real power of God. The stuff you read about in the Word of God. <clears throat> the stuff that you've heard about. The stuff that you've YouTubed and Googled. It's real. And it's here. It's here today and it's here today for you. Jesus, is it real? Or are these people just crazy? Why don't you come and taste and see that the Lord is good? Let's open our hearts to Him right now. That's something powerful. Flood our soul. Right intentions. close your eyes and lift your hands and just say, hey. 